guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California, and we are so glad you decided to make us part of your day. Also, here is Mark Ellis. Hey, everybody. Thanks to all the kids that came out to the Pasadena Ice House this weekend, where they made me an honorary fire chief. <laughs> really? I'm an honorary member of the LAFD, so if you have a fire in your house. <laughs> <laughs> also here, Jeremy John. I'm going to put that with my pilot wings I got from American <laughs> Airlines when I was five, my friend. We're professionals now. Also here, Christian Harloff. I, I don't know if this is a story to tell, but yesterday a five-year-old told me, get me a drink. And I looked at him and said, I only deal in pleases and thank yous and walked Ooh. away. That's why I did to a five-year-old kid. I, I, it's I a good problems. line. Yeah. It's a good line. <laughs> hey, listen, guys, as happens sometimes, sometimes uh, something drops, something happens in the world movies, but at, that occur after we get these wonderful topics here already on the list, and Ghost in the Shell dropped a brand new trailer uh, late last night, early this morning. Mark Ellis, you had a chance to check out this trailer. What did you think about well, the Ghost John, in the Shell trailer? Well, John, as a fan of Dark Man, I loved one of the lines in this movie. I'm everywhere, I am nowhere. And I'm like, that's from Dark Man. Now, that might be from Ghost in the Shell, too. I know it's from the Liam Neeson early 90s flick. Look, this trailer was what I've seen from Ghost in the Shell trailers already. It's a lot of cool looking, bright colors, this weird science fiction universe. So I'm intrigued. I don't know a lot about the story. I'm not a big Ghost in the Shell fan. So what I can tell you from watching this trailer is that I'm still a little confused as to exactly what we're getting with this movie, but it's definitely something that I'm still looking forward to. Trailer would have been better if someone said, take the fucking elephant, and then gave someone an elephant in the background, just melted away in anger. That would have been great. Uh, no, this is the first trailer that uh, Ghost in the Shell actually gave me as someone who doesn't really know the lore of Ghost in the Shell that really intrigued me to go, oh, I'm looking forward to the movie now because it looked neat. I love that scene where the cyborg lady like, turns into a spider and spider crawls away. Uh, a lot of great imagery, and uh, now I'm looking forward to it. Good job, trailer. Christian. Uh, I dug it. I, it. It felt like a bit of Blade Runner uh, mixed with, I guess, Dark Man dialogue. A lot of Dark for Man sure. in there. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it had a very, it's kind of, I said to John as I was watching, I was like, this is, I feel like this is what I wanted Lucy to be when I was, I mean, I haven't seen the movie, obviously, but that's the kind of feel and tone. I was way more interested in this trailer than I have been. I've been interested in the other ones, but I just, it was so <clears throat> kooky, it was a little, it was so weird, and I'm glad I didn't learn a lot about it, because I don't, that's, this is really all I need to know. I got enough about the story, the fact that she's trying to figure out who the hell she is, did the people kind of screw her over, did they give her a good life? We're gonna find out, and I'm I'm pretty excited to do so. Look, I uh, I was one of the few people that when they first released those like little mini trailers, you know, the eight <laughs> seconds each, and they released like eight of them, whatever. I didn't I wasn't impressed by it. I didn't think it looked all that interesting. The last trailer caught my attention. This trailer's got me on board. This this is the trailer that has got me on board that now I can legitimately say I am excited to watch this movie. I mean, I, I probably should have been just because of the source material, but you never know what they're gonna do. We've seen lots of movies based on great source material <laughs> that turn out terrible. But this looks great. The visual aesthetic is now that I'm getting more of a context to the movie, the visual aesthetic that they're going for makes more sense to me. Um, I'm liking her in it. I'm liking the even the voice they used of what we can only assume is your main antagonist in the film. Looks good. So, yeah, I am on board with this. This sounds great. All right, let's get to our first official story of the day. Imagine that. More drama in the world of Batman. <laughs> Ashley, what's going on? A couple weeks ago, Ben Affleck announced he would not direct the Batman, but would remain on board to star and produce. Ever since, Warner Brothers has been searching for directors, and now, according to Variety, they've landed on War for the Planet of the Apes helmer Matt Reeves. Variety reports that Reeves was always high on the list, but THR also added that the studio was also looking at Ridley Scott and Fetty Alvarez to helm the movie as well. The script is is reportedly still in development with an official release date yet to be determined. John, what do you think about Matt Reeves helming the Batman? Well, let's, let's be very clear here. He has not signed on to direct Batman yet. He is in talks. That means nine times out of 10, he is going to end up signing on once you reach that stage. But let's also remember that Joaquin Phoenix was in talks to play Doctor Strange and that fell apart. So it's not locked yet, but let's operate on the assumption that it will be for a minute. When it was announced that Ben Affleck was stepping down as the director of Batman. One of the things that I said, and I still completely believe this, was that they what Warner Brothers cannot do, understanding the shaky perception that people have of the DC universe right now and all that kind of stuff, what they cannot do is go out and get a director who's been directing a bunch of music videos that nobody's heard of. They need to get a name. 
They need to get somebody in here that will not only A, and most importantly, potentially do a really good job with the movie, they have to B, right now, make the fan base feel more secure and make the fan base feel better about it. I could totally believe that's something they needed to do. And in a guy like Matt Reeves, if they sign him and if this gets completed, I believe that's a name that accomplishes that. Look, I'm not a big fan of Cloverfield. I, I just wasn't a huge fan of it. But Matt Reeves was able to do something that is one of the most rare things. It's like hitting for the cycle in baseball. Make a sequel to a good movie that's actually better than the first one. <laughs> that's an almost impossible thing to do in this business. It's happened a handful of times in the history of Hollywood. Yet he was able to do that with the Apes franchise. Like a lot of people didn't think you can't possibly improve upon what they did with that first one. And he did. He made it better. And it's got us all excited for this next one. So that part is really, really interesting. But it only makes this drama surrounding the Batman franchise a little bit more interesting. Let's take a couple of steps back and we'll see how this all ties together. So last week, a report comes out from Forbes. Forbes puts out a written report saying that it looks like Warner Brothers is looking at either doing a, a, a major rewrite on the script or be scrapping it all together and going back to stage one. That's what Forbes wrote. So that was out there. Now follow me here. This is where things get really interesting. So after that happens, Batman News, a, a website that does a great job covering all things Batman and DC, they do a wonderful job. The guy at Batman News reached out and talked to, I believe his name is Justin Kroll, mm -hmm who is a reporter for Variety, who has covered the Batman stuff. And he, a Kroll, told the guy from Batman News, I've heard that they actually really like the script, and so does Ben Affleck, and everybody's happy with it. So Batman News runs with that as a story, and they covered it perfectly, perfectly. They, they, they wrote it, they handled themselves totally appropriately. They wrote, they didn't say, uh, this is official, this is confirmed. They wrote that, hey, we talked to this guy and this guy told us this and they ran the perfect story. They did it completely appropriately. But then every other uh, website starts running with that as a story as well. Understandably so. I mean, it's, it's a big piece of news out there because you have this piece of news out there that they're scrapping the Batman script and now if you were getting a report that no, they're happy with it. So obviously other sites start to run with that too because the guy from Batman News talked to a reporter from Variety. Here's where it gets interesting. Do you know the only outlet that hasn't run with Warner Brothers is happy with the script story? Variety. <laughs> Variety has not run with this as a story. Justin Kroll, the writer for Variety, did not, as of now, could change in the next 10 minutes, could change in the next 10 days, did not write a story on Variety. They didn't feel good enough or solid enough or secure enough in the sources to actually write a story about this in Variety, but in talking to somebody from another site, he mentions, I've heard this, and everybody else ran with the story. And nobody did anything inappropriate, by the way. Nobody did anything wrong. It's just another example of the internet culture where we heard this, and because I had a whole ton of people writing to me on Twitter, I'm sure you guys have heard this yeah. too, saying, did you hear that it's confirmed that Warner Brothers? Actually, no, it's not confirmed. One guy talked to another guy who says he talked to another guy who heard this, and then even that guy didn't feel good enough about it for to write about it on his own site. <laughs> um, now, if you follow that up a little bit further, when you go to Justin Kroll's Twitter, he has the tweet that he said, um, you know, hey, I've heard Warner Brothers likes the script, and I've heard, and I'm sure he was told that. But he followed that up with another tweet that says this. That means absolutely nothing. <laughs> so he himself, so you see, this is a great example of where you got all these really good people in this industry who know how to do their jobs correctly. And yet we as fans, and I'm guilty of this, I'm sure everybody at this table is guilty of this, I'm sure you're guilty of this. What we sometimes as fans do, don't actually read what it is that's being said and we run with it. Now does that mean that whoever told Crawl that the Batman script is liked over at Warner Brothers. Does that mean that this not, that's not true? Not at all. It very well could be true. But one thing that some sources brought up to me this week was rather interesting. It was that Warner Brothers considers themselves very much so to be a director's studio. And therefore, remember, not recently, and I think, Jeremy, you're the one who pointed this out to me. Oh, shoot. Sure. That when you said that the Flash getting its script completely thrown out and Ben Affleck leaving as director, you felt that the two were kind of connected. Yeah. I talked to another source this week who said to me is that the idea is Warner Brothers likes to give their directors 
some control and direction over what script they get. And since they knew they were bringing in another director for Flash, they thought, let's just get rid of the script and let the director have some say in what's going on with the script. And they're also saying that perhaps that's the same situation with Batman. That's like, you know what, we got another director coming in, get rid of the script and let the, this director have their say what they want with the script. So, I mean, it's a lot of interesting turning cogs of the wheel in this whole <laughs> Batman drama that seems never ending. I know, Mark, you've heard about all this. You've seen this unfold. What do you first, first of all, what do you think about Matt Reeves? Directing the Batman, assuming he do, we don't hear another announcement six weeks from now that he dropped out like every other DC director. Um, what do you think about Matt Reeves as a potential director for Batman? And then what do you think about this whole thing? I mean, the idea of Matt Reeves is intriguing, but I'm glad you pointed out at the top of your piece is that, look, it, he's in talks. And so it is not confirmed right now. In my dating career, I was in talks with a lot of women. <laughs> never really panned out. So we can't totally believe that Matt Reeves, the Apes guy, is going to be doing the new Batman movie. If he is doing it, that's a great choice. Like, if I was having a fantasy yeah. draft of directors, I would want to do a Batman movie. Movie, he would be my second or third round pick. I still say Fetty Alvarez is the right guy to do it because I just want to see what his dark vision of it. But what Reeves is able to do with the way the storylines unfold in Apes is a perfect compliment to what he could do in Batman if he gets the chance or if he wants to get the chance or if Warner Brothers hires him then continues to give him the chance because that's what it really all boils down to is why are directors leaving? What are they not being given from a creative standpoint, from an intellectual standpoint, whatever it is, there's something that is missing there. And with all this other Batman news, at some point you have to say where there's this much smoke, there's going to be fire. And I don't think that we've seen the fire yet. And I'm an honorary <laughs> fire chief, John. I know my way around solving these kind of cases. Jeremy, number one, what would you think about Matt Reeves directing? A Batman film number two. What do you think of this whole thing? <laughs> well, Matt Reeves dire uh, Reeve directing, uh, like we've said, he's a great choice. Uh, he did uh, Apes is a prime example of what he could do for Batman and making the uh, the sequel better than the first one. This whole thing, man, I'm telling you, this reminds me of the phrase uh, my best friend's sister's boyfriend's brother's girlfriend heard from this guy who knows this girl that Ferris passed out in 31 <laughs> Flavors last night. I guess it's pretty serious. That is the speculation <laughs> well nature. Done. Thank you very much. Uh, but that's the speculation nature of uh, online. We, we, we hear information and people online want to run with it and run with it. And before you know it, there's a save Ferris blimp above the Warner's lot because, you know, we all start speculating about it. But, I mean, it's fun to speculate as long as you just kind of keep it in check and see the facts. And the facts are right now that there is a... Th this script's been tossed out, this script's been tossed out, and there's a director in talks. That's what we know, um, and we'll see where it goes. But it is interesting how there was some sort of divide over the weekend of two different stories, seemingly yeah. conflicting stories. And so, I mean, and that's not bad for them. People, no matter or what are talking about it on the right hand or the left hand. I think that's fascinating. It's interesting stuff. We will see what happens. We'll talk about it in three days when we have a new piece of news. <laughs> Christian, please make sense out of all this for us. Uh, that's impossible. But what I will say is I'm going to go the other side of where I'm going to take Warner Brothers' side here. And I'm going to say I think that what they're probably trying to do now is right the ship. And by getting someone like Matt Reeves and going to get Matt Reeves, I think what it does is that when you talk to Matt Reeves, even over Fede Alvarez, who I think would be a fun choice, what I think about Reeves is when you look at what he did, what you alluded to before with the way that he came on to Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, mm. When you listen to him speak about that movie, this is someone who went into the lore, went into there. Were, I mean, there were references to this, to the original movie of, of of Apes. There were things about the characters. There was the way that he worked with Andy Serkis. He is an actor's director. He is there's there's something about the guy that just he brings certain materials to life in the way that you want a director to do it. It's not just about flashy looking big. It's about the emotions of the character, and you want that with Batman. And what I think Warner Brothers is probably trying to do. Look, we all like Ben Affleck as. Batman. Even the guys that didn't think that mm -hmm. he was the right choice at first, we all think he was probably the best thing about Batman v Superman. Maybe the choices that he's making for this script were wrong. Maybe they were wrong. Maybe the, I mean, look, we, we yell and we scream about, how are they, are they screwing this up? Because we loved the town. We loved, uh, you know, Argo, and we loved Gone Baby Gone. He also did Live by Night. Maybe there was something that, maybe there was something that came out of the last two kind of opportunities that he's had. Maybe that you, we, you have, like if you're a fighter, you have off, you have off days. If you're if you're anybody in a business, you're off days. Maybe he's just off right now, and that's fine. You're allowed to do that. But maybe one of us is like, this is not the direction we want to go to, and they're not on the same page, and they're trying to right the ship. I'm going to be positive in that side to think that Warner Brothers right now wants to say, okay, if we if even if they wind up losing Affleck as Batman, if that happens, which is maybe it's possible, maybe it's not. If that happens. We're all going to be up in arms and be like, oh, it's, it's all over. Maybe they're trying to right the ship and get us into a new place. I would I, love to believe that. 
And I and I and <laughs> my, my, my issue with that is that we've had so many other things happen I get in DC it. where it's like I mean I'm pretty sure Rick Famuyiwa you know, had a good idea of what he wanted to do with the Flash and they're like nah not cool or Michelle McLaren or whoever else that they wanted to bring on it's like at some point you have to say who is really in the wrong here I do believe that Warner Brothers has a cool vision for Batman and I am with Christian where I think Matt Reeves is totally the right guy to do it because he proved with Apes that he was able to play in somebody else's sandbox and not just make it a bunch of member berries but also build it up into a new world a lot in the same way that I think Colin Trevorrow succeeded I know that's maybe people like to debate how good Jurassic World was but he was able to take something that was existing a property that we loved and build something new out of it I think Matt Reeves can be that guy Matt Reeves can absolutely be that guy I think there's a, there's a handful of names that you could have said to direct it I mean David Fincher was the name of a lot of people's mouths mm -hmm. I think that would have been great but I think Matt Reeves look if Matt Reeves directs I still don't think Matt Reeves is of the caliber of director as Ben Affleck but Matt Reeves is a really good director and mm -hmm. if he's directing Batman count me as interested now let me throw one other thing out there I wasn't sure whether I should share this or not but I will okay let me let me give this asterisk though on this all right I am not Norris Collider video in the scoop game we right. we don't like doing scoops so please don't consider anything of what I'm about to say as any sort of a scoop I have tried I believe twice in my career to break a scoop and both times I have been bit firmly in me anus, okay? So the anus. <laughs> yeah. They went right oh, past the cheek. They went past the cheek and went wow. right for the violation. Chainous. So what so <laughs> about seven years ago, I found out through a very reliable source, very reliable source, that the Academy Award winning actor, Adrian Brody, was going to be Ant Man in Edgar Wright's Ant Man. I, I, like, the source was so reliable, I was 100% sure about it. I was still doing the movie blog at the time. And I wrote a story about, he's going to be Ant-Man. 48 hours later, Edgar Wright writes me. <laughs> and says, um, no, he's not. <laughs> so, I mean, I, so I got burned. Burned so bad, I didn't even work on scoops again until, like, last year. Right. When this report comes out that um, Snoke was the, the, at least going to look like Plagueis looks like in all the Plagueis artwork, mm -hmm. right? I got on the phone, talked to two separate sources that both confirmed to me, yep, that's true. Dead wrong, dead wrong. So twice I have tried to break <laughs> scoops and twice I've been totally bitten in the ass, which is why I stay out of the scoop game. It, it, it's a fool's errand of, of a thing to do. I leave it to the guys who really know how to do it, okay? Now, that being said, and the reason why this is going to be in the title of this video is, is to take this for what it's worth. This is coming from a guy who's been burned twice by Scoop, so please take this with a massive, massive grain of salt, okay? Don't share this around or whatever, but I'm just letting you guys know, over the past four days, I've talked to three separate people, uh, both in one way or another connected some way to what's going on over at Warner Brothers. And what all three have told me was that Nothing about whether the script was thrown out or whether they liked the script. Nothing about the, the direction of Matt Reeves is taking it, none of that. But one of the things that has come out of the conversation of all three was this. Was that they're telling me, Ben Affleck, make no mistake, he does want out. Batman, he doesn't want to be Batman anymore. Ooh. Um, is, is what I've been told. Now, whether that's true or not, I was also told that, uh, you know, Pianist Boy was going to be Ant-Man, and that turned out to be totally wrong. So take this with a grain of salt. Ashley was like, what is yeah. Yeah. <laughs> The piano, <laughs> Ashley. The piano. The piano playing. Folks. Hey, Pianist Boy. So I, I have been told that he, uh, that Affleck is talking with Warner Brothers in an attempt to get out of being Batman. And if they do not let him out of being Batman, that the standalone Batman film that ultimately happens will be the last time we see Affleck as Batman. Because uh, apparently he wants out. Now, again, take that with a giant grain of salt. I right. mean, I, I have been burned on this crap before. I could be... this. What the information is being fed to me could be completely wrong. Uh, I just, as a part of the conversation, I thought I would share it with you. Do with that as you will. What I gleaned from that story is that John Camp he got bit in the anus by a pianist right. boy. <laughs> <laughs> Heinous. <laughs> Uh, You're a professional yeah. firefighter, Mark Ellis. Ellis. Professional <laughs> firefighter. Just but taking you know, a hose on this whole thing. But you know, at some point, look, if, if Warner Brothers is listening to everybody, you raise a really good point, Christian. Thank you. If, if Warner Brothers is listening to people, they understand, look, there are fans out there of Batman versus Superman. I like Batman versus Superman. There are fans out there of Suicide Squad. I happen to like Suicide Squad. But they know a lot of people didn't. Mm -hmm. And if they are in a position now where they're going, like, you know what? We need to honor this universe that is so deep and so rich. We need to, as you put it, right the ship. 
it does concern me that it feels like every six months we're hearing about them riding the ship. Uh, and yet they, they consistently end up in the same spot. But if they are going, I'm going to say this, I am hopeful. Because if they are actually cleaning house at this point, say, so you know what, get rid of that Flash script, get rid of the, the Batman script, you know, let's, let's really do this right and start from scratch, then that's not a bad thing. It would be unfortunate that they have an Academy Award winning writer in Ben Affleck and a guy who happens to direct movies that win Best Picture at the Oscars in Ben Affleck and they have to move away from that, whatever. Just, you know what, if three years from now we're talking about a great Wonder Woman movie and two great Justice League movies and a great Batman standalone movie, then all of it will have been worth it. So will it turn out that way? Who knows? We'll just have to wait and see. All right, Ashley, what's... I was going to say something, but I'm not. What's next? <laughs> <laughs> Marvel and Disney debuted a new behind-the-scenes video announcing the official start of filming for Avengers Infinity War. In the video, we see Robert Downey Jr., Chris Pratt, and new Spider-Man himself, Tom Holland, all together on the inaugural day of shooting. The video showcased some brief behind-the-scenes footage, as well as new concept art of Josh Brolin as Thanos and Rocket Raccoon fighting alongside Thor. Avengers Infinity War is set for release on May 4, 2018. Jeremy what do you think of the behind the scenes video for Infinity War? I think Thanos looks like he's going to fight someone in a bar. Like, <laughs> I think he looks like he's going to stab a Nosigan at the Domjot table. That's Doesn't how hard he looks. like he Clay looks. from Sons of Anarchy in that picture <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. He does look like uh, like uh, Perlman Rock for sure. Roman, yeah. Uh, yeah, I thought this footage was awesome. I thought it was great. It kind of gives you a look into you know the the actors and how they're perceiving it i love that tom holland was like i was a fan of you guys and now i'm here because I mean, a lot of times you're like oh you're spider-man kid so you know it, whatever it's a job but it's not to him there was a time he was just a fan of the avengers movies now he's in the avengers movies this kid is on cloud nine good job tom holland uh, i love that you see that the guardians of the galaxy are going to meet up with the other avengers i think that's our the avengers rather i think that's great um i thought the footage was fantastic and then robert downey jr is like this is a year of our lives that we're going to do spend yeah. filming this thing so to them when it wraps that might be a bittersweet thing that's going to be their lives for a year but i thought it was a great first look and a peek behind the curtain for fans i thought it was awesome look normally i really don't care about these little this, this is a corporate piece of marketing right, and, right. and normally i don't care but i'll be honest i i was really taken in by it seeing that shot in that little video of robert downey jr tom holland and chris pratt all stand there together right. pratt's in his star lord jack and what that really did feel kind of special right and it is kind of funny talking going from one hand talking about all the disarray at, at dc at dc as they're trying to pull this thing together and write that ship and and give the fans what they deserve in those dc movies to a group that's just got their shit together mm. and you know you see you see those shots of kevin feige sitting there it's like this has been our vision from day one we, we've got this plot we're doing this blah blah, blah. and you're right i love that shot of thanos just with the shaved head and all that <laughs> right. kind of stuff. That looked pretty badass. I, I really enjoyed it. Normally, I don't give two craps about these corporate pieces of marketing. What do you think? I think that what it is, I've been saying for a very long time, and I, you and I have been on the same page, that what the way that Marvel's been treating this is like a television show. It's like every new movie is like a brand new episode that fits the narrative, and this is the series finale. Now, yes, we're going to get more movies down the line, but they're really going to be spin-offs because there's going to be new characters and everything, too. Like the storyline, the narrative that was set forth since Iron Man, which Feige said in this, in this piece, Big things are going to happen in this movie. Something like the the end of everything that we have seen raising from this part one of Iron Man back in was it two thousand eight, and now we're going to see it happen. You felt that in this piece. That's what I liked about this piece is that you know it was, you didn't get too much out of it. The the confirmation of things we kind of knew already. The Spider Man's in it, Guardians are in it, but to see them together, it just it's it's when we every time we talk about Jedi Council when we're talking about Episode eight or nine, mm. it's like it just feels real. Yeah, watching them all together, it feels real. You're going to get this big moment. The first time when you were in, in 2012 when you sat and you watched the Avengers for the first time and you were thrown back to that moment. Uh, as a kid, just seeing all these characters together, and then you got to see them on the big screen. We're now immune to that, but we won't be when this comes out, because now these characters that we haven't seen together, like the Star-Lord and other characters too, and then Spider-Man there together, it, it was nice to see a, a little bit of an appetizer of what we're really gonna get. You know what, now that you mention that, uh, I'm not, not that I'm advocating DC trying to copy Marvel. You know what I would make, as a DC fan, would make me feel really good right now? If DC could release some behind-the-scenes footage of the guys making Justice League, right. of all, show us, put out a three-minute video, show us everybody there having fun. It's Affleck, get out of my dressing room. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, show us a video of, of, of Snyder and, and, and Momoa and all the people in Godot 
everybody there having fun and having a good mm -hmm. time, I think that would go a long way. Putting out a video like this one to make us feel just a little bit more ease, at ease. I don't know. What did you think about this video? Yeah, uh, they, uh, well, uh, all right. Well, I, I thought exactly what I said the first sorry, time sorry, I, I mean, talked think, about like, it. Sorry, but, uh, <laughs> I mean, what do you think about like, maybe How Warner Brothers doing this? They have not. <laughs> Christian did bring up a couple of good points, but I do agree with you that uh, they try. I think they tried to do that with Momoa. He had the electric guitar. You know, you see him yeah. with Aquaman and whatnot. But I agree that a video would go a long way in showing uh, what we could do. And I do, uh, if adding on to my points of what I made a few minutes ago, I, I like when Feige was like, we couldn't just have all the Avengers going against this huge threat. This is going to be the biggest threat they face, so what do we do? We have to break them apart and tear them apart with Civil War. And you really do see the 10-year plan that they had leading right. up to this. You know, I thought that was really cool. But uh, yeah, I do agree that I, I'd like to see some of them, like Gal Gadot hanging out with, uh, you know, Ben Affleck and... Uh, like actually know, on set. Yeah, Momoa, yeah. and they're all given five, like, all right, yeah, all right, let's get down and dirty, and then they start fighting. You know, that'd be pretty sweet. Remember Mark. when the Avengers came out and we're like, man, I wonder how all of them are going to get the same amount of screen time and right. can they get six into one movie and we're like yeah and then Civil War came out I was like how are they going to give it enough screen time to satisfy our appetite for all these characters and they did it brilliantly so and now we have this and this is this is the super team of super teams and that's why I like this bit is that it was a celebration of this idea that they had a long time ago that a lot of people said they were crazy for trying to start with Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man and look at where we are <laughs> Now, it's really exciting, and I don't always like behind-the-scenes videos like this. I mean, we said on Jedi Council last week, I would not be a fan of seeing The Last Jedi's first piece of promo material be a behind-the-scenes featurette. I want to mm. see a trailer first. With something like this, it's so early in the game that we just get to get excited about this before we see footage from this movie, which you probably won't see for another year. All right, what's next? It's Monday, which means it's time for the weekend box office report. The Lego Batman movie took the number one spot with an opening weekend debut of $55.6 million. The Lego movie spinoff also opened with $37 million internationally for a combined $92.6 million worldwide debut. And the number two spot was Universal's Fifty Shades Darker. The second movie in the Fifty Shades franchise finished with a slightly stronger than expected $46.8 million. The movie also delivered $100.1 million overseas, the fourth largest international opening weekend ever for an R-rated film behind the original Fifty Shades of Grey. In the number three spot was John Wick Chapter 2. The movie debuted with $30 million at the domestic box office and $10.6 million internationally for a combined $40.6 million. In the number four spot was Universal Split, dropping just 35.4% with $9.3 million as its domestic total climbs to $112.3 million. And in the number five spot was Hidden Figures, earning $8 million with a domestic Domestic total now at an impressive 131.4 million. Mark, thoughts on the weekend box office? Well, Ashley, it's how I hope the weekend would shake out because there's no way that I thought Fifty Shades Darker could compete with Lego Batman because Lego Batman is such a fun movie going experience and it has such great replay value where you could see that movie five times and still pick up new jokes, new yep. things in there. So Lego Batman is definitely earning of its number one spot. It was also nice to see John Wick 2 do as well as it did. There's no way that you're stopping Fifty Shades shades darker from having a great opening weekend but when you look at like the Rotten Tomatoes score Lego Batman is around 91 percent 50 shades darker is nine percent so the word of mouth is it's going generous. to get out and I think it's going to dip heavily whereas I think Lego Batman can sustain for a lot longer than people might think what's really interesting to me is that Arrival made four hundred and fifty five thousand dollars at the box office this weekend which means it needs just under six hundred thousand to crack a hundred million domestically I'd love to see people go out give a rival a shot so we could get to that magic number uh this box office report is about halves and doubles and two really good one the doubles the original john wick film on its opening weekend made 14 million dollars oh, wow. it's more than doubled what it did this this movie has doubled what the original did which is great it's, it's a really good sign of the word of mouth about the original that people wanted to see more 50 shades dropped almost in half because the first Fifty Shades made over $80 million in its opening weekend and has dropped by almost half down to 46. And it is one of the worst motion pictures ever made. <laughs> ever made. I said this on my review. I will say it here again. I've always said I had my holy trinity of the three worst wide-release Hollywood big budget movies of all time. Catwoman, in no particular order, Catwoman, Highlander 2, and Battlefield Earth. It is now a Mount Rushmore <laughs> of the worst films ever, ever made because Fifty Shades Darker has taken its place. The first Fifty Shades movie was just a, it was a bad movie, but it was nothing something, not something I was gonna remember for the rest of my life so epically. It was just bad. 
this is epically bad. I mean, it's so awful. And like the first Fifty Shades dropped 80% from week one to week two, I fully expect Fifty Shades Darker will drop 70 to 80% as well to keep that proud tradition going. On top of that, had a chance last week to watch Hidden Figures again. So happy for the success of that film. This is, this is one of the films that this year is being not talked about enough. The performance is in a stellar, the direction, it's incredible. I, watching it again, I actually kind of thought, you know what, Kevin Costner could have gotten nominated for Best Supporting Actor as well. I thought Costner was as good in that as he's been in anything before. So really good special movie. Check it out if you get a chance. Anyway, what do you think about the box office? Look, we, there's, there's no doubt that um, we got, you look at this box office and we got the funniest comedy of the year. It just happened to come in at number two. Um, because <laughs> it, it is, it, it is, it is hysterical. It is really funny. I, that's why I won't put it in the worst of all time because I got some belly laughs at that stupid thing. Um, but you're right; it's going to have a tremendous drop off. I think there, it, some people will see it on Valentine's Day. We'll see it tomorrow. That you'll see a spike probably tomorrow, and then it'll it'll go away. But Lego Batman, I actually saw again yesterday with my daughter, and it is such, it's just such a such fun, a funny. It's it's clever. It it does justice to the overall uh, lore of Batman. It's 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 done with respect, and it's done. Um, it's it's a really good movie. I'm glad to see what Lego's doing so far. You're right, John Wick too, though. The fact that it doubled what it made opening weekend, I am excited for that too because I want to see more of these movies. I thought that that was another one where I was like, oh, they're just going to capitalize on the first one. They're going to repeat the same thing, and they didn't. They, you, of course, you get the action that you wanted, but you do so more with the lore. So I am liking everything I, that's coming out of John Wick. Hidden Figures and even Split to, to, for Split to keep tacking on money. Good. These are all movies that I want to see do well. And I might actually, Fifty Shades Darker, when it comes out on Blu-ray, I <laughs> am going to be begging to do the commentary for us. <laughs> I, I really want to do it. Even if I watch it by myself. Uh, I, I would it, watch that. Yeah. You so, just you watching it by, by yourself. myself. <laughs> yeah, Lego Batman. It won the uh, won the box office and the popular vote, and I'm super, 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 super pumped about that. Some months ago, we were hypothesizing this weekend. I forgot when it was, but we were like, "Hey, Valentine's week is going to be a pretty packed week. What do you think the order is?" And I'm pretty sure a lot of us were on this order where Lego Batman was going to win. Fifty Shades was going to win over John Wick, but I think John Wick has a lot more staying power than Fifty Shades because, yeah. I mean, Fifty Shades is going to drop out. As for Lego Batman, I think it's going to be number one next weekend also. If you look at what's coming out next weekend, there's not a lot of competition for Lego Batman. As you guys said, Lego Batman has a lot of rewatchability. It has a lot of Batman love in it. It has a lot of movie lover love in it. So Lego Batman was more than I thought I wanted out of it. It was more than I thought it could be. And uh, Fifty Shades was worse than I thought it could be, which meant my review was more fun than I thought it could be. Could be. I just uh, <laughs> throw it out in there. So you have a 90% movie in Batman, a 9% movie in Fifty Shades, and a 90% Rotten Tomato movie in John Wick 2. <laughs> John Wick 2 is, is 10 also, times the man. I mean, it's just, it's just, there are a couple of great movies in theater this week. Yeah, I mean, are. with yeah, Batman yeah. and John Wick, I mean, that's really something to see. All right, guys, we reached out part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her ass, she's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. Then those at the table are something to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Ashley, what do we got? Deadline reports that talks between Will Smith and Disney have ended, and Smith will not be starring in Dumbo, the Tim Burton directed live action adaptation of the classic 1941 animated film. The report states Smith didn't commit for usual reasons that include salary and scheduling. Disney is continuing to move aggressively towards a production start with a script by Transformers Age of Extinction writer Aaron Kruger. Christian, buy or sell a Dumbo movie without Will Smith in the starring role. I mean, I wasn't really buying a Dumbo movie in general, but I'll still buy it without him because I don't think you... It's This is not a movie that needs a big superstar like Will Smith in order to succeed. Um, you got Tim Burton, who's been hit or miss lately, but it's really... It's it's Disney, and it's the Disney marking machine on some of their older properties, like, you know, the animated properties that they've been doing, successful. Do I think that it needs Will Smith to be successful? No, it doesn't. Would it have helped? Of course it would have, but it, it's not... You're not going to... Oh, no, you absolutely shouldn't do this movie now that you don't have him. I think it's going to be hard to do a Dumbo movie in general. But because remember, the, the difference is when you do something like Lion King or Jungle Book, the animals are talking and you're making it work. Nobody talks in Dumbo. And they're going to have to add some human character in there, like they were going to do, I guess, with Will Smith or whoever's coming in there. And you might lose what the original story was all about. And then you're going to get a little, maybe a little too weird, minus the pink elephant scene with Tim Burton, which would be perfect for it. But other than that, I don't know. I, I don't know if I need this movie, but I'm not going to sell it because Will Smith's in it. <clears throat> 
Jeremy. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that uh, pink elephant scene because that that any dream tripping nightmare segment, I think Tim Burton's going to be in his wheelhouse for that. I don't think the movie needs Will Smith, but it would need a better writer than someone who wrote Transformers Age of Extinction. That would help. And for <laughs> Tim Burton to do, I mean, I, I just, Tim Burton, Disney, I go back to the uh, Alice in Wonderland movie, wasn't really a fan of that one. So I, I can see why Disney's pushing for a live action movie because, I mean, they're all like really hitting right now. People are super pumped for uh, Beauty and the Beast. So that is strike while the iron's hot kind of thing. But I'm going to sell the whole thing in general for the fact that Will Smith, I feel like, could have added an element of heart to the movie as we saw in, uh, what was that movie he just came out with? The movie wasn't that Clatter great, but, but he was great in it, you know? So Will Smith adds what he needs to add to a movie like this, but, I mean, without him and the, uh, the writer of a Transformers movie, I can't say I'm looking forward to it, directed by Tim Burton. We'll see what happens, but for right now, I'm going to be like, eh, cool, Beauty and the Beast is coming out. You know, I, I was going to say, I, look, I buy that Will Smith has stepped away from this. I Look, I like Will Smith very much. I actually thought he was really quite good in Collateral yeah, Beauty. He wasn't he was a lot there to work with, but I thought he was quite good in it. I think he's a very, very good actor. But I never bought the fit. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't see Will Smith... Uh, like being in a Dumbo movie. Now, at the same time, I still sell the project as a whole. I also don't see Tim Burton as a good fit for this movie, period. <laughs> I, I don't know what Disney's thinking about it. I mean, I know that one Alice in Wonderland made a lot of money for you guys, but it sucked. Um, so, I, I mean, I just don't buy the project as all, and I'm totally cool with Will Smith stepping away because I never saw it as a fit for him or for the movie in the first place. I don't know, Mark, what about you? Two movies were on constant rotation uh, for a young Mark Ellis, and that would be Dumbo and Mary Poppins, and now we have reimaginings of both of those properties, and I don't know which one I care less about, but I can at least tell you this. The Mary Poppins sequel that they're doing, that at least would be a buy for me. This is a sell. I don't know why you need to make another Dumbo movie I cry every time I see Dumbo when he's rubbing trunks with his mom who's been wrongfully in prison. God, it's an emotional moment. I'm tearing up just thinking about it. I don't need to see another Dumbo movie. I don't. I don't think that it fits in with what Disney is doing with all these live-action reimaginings of their classic animated works. Skip over Dumbo. You don't have to remake every one of them. I totally buy this move for Will Smith because of scheduling or salary, whatever it is, this means that he can focus on reinvigorating the Bad Boys franchise, which is something we definitely need back on our plates. So I will take Bad Boys for life all day over a live-action Dumbo movie. Let me ask uh, the ladies this. I, I, I'm just curious, just in general, Wendy, let me start with you. Just in general, are you, are you excited about or anticipating a Dumbo live action? I mean, no, not really. When they first said it, I was like, well, okay, I guess that's cool. But it's not one of the first movie I would like to see them make into live action. Um, I mean, Jungle Book aside, that was really good because I, I wasn't expecting it to be that good too. So Dumbo could be just as, success just as successful, but... I was thinking something more in the realms of fairy tales like Cinderella and, Sleep and Sleeping Beauty and Mulan and things like that. Ashley, what about you? Um, honestly, the idea of a Tim Burton Dumbo movie really scares me. Like, I just keep picturing, like, an elephant with those Coraline button eyes and, like, the stitching everywhere. It sounded like a horror movie to me. I don't think this is, like, the right fit. You know what scene would look cool, though, if, if it is Tim Burton? The pink, the elephant on parade yeah. part. Oh, yeah. Sounds with the yeah. elephants. <laughs> All right. What's next? Universal Pictures announced Friday that Joel and Ethan Cohen have come into script the studio Scarface remake, with THR also reporting that Hell or High Water director David McKenzie and Patriots Day director Peter Berg are in talks with Universal to helm the movie. It was recently revealed that Magnificent Seven director Antoine Fuqua had dropped out of directing in order to finish work on the Equalizer sequel with Diego Luna, also revealed to be attached to Star. The movie is headed into pre-production with Universal officially dating the movie for an August 10, 2018 release. John Byer saw the Scarface remake with a Coen Brothers script and either David McKenzie or Peter Berg directing. Uh, buy, buy, and buy. I mean, that's all great. Look, I, I was bummed to hear that uh, Fuqua was stepping out of the film. That's unfortunate. I, I like him very much, but when you're talking about bringing this writing team to a property like Scarface, when you're talking about bringing that level, especially after watching Deepwater Horizon and Patriot's Day, the idea of Peter Berg directing this is actually really mouthwatering. I mean, it's really cool. And then obviously after watching Hell or High Water, I don't see a bad scenario here at all. Now, I know there are a lot of people saying, you can't remake Scarface, you can't remake Scarface. Just remember that Scarface that you're thinking about was also itself a remake. <laughs> so keep that in mind, too. This could be great. So for me, it's a big buy. Yeah, it's a huge buy for me, too. The only, the only bummer is, this is the down part of this scenario, is that you can see everyone listed as can, if they all came together contributing something great to the Scarface remake. Thing is, they're not. Some of them are in competition. And so yes. it's like, well... 
All right, that's the scenario I want to see is where all of them come together because I agree, Anton uh, Fuqua was a loss of sorts. Where I'm like, oh, he could have added something to that Scarface movie. However, with the Coen brothers writing, because there have been projects where, I mean, they're not just writers uh, of the movies they direct. They've written movies they haven't directed and it does show in their work. Uh, so I think this entire team coming together, making a Scarface remake, I think it's great. Uh, and like you said, it's like, no, Scarface itself is a remake. Remakes have their place. And Scarface is a prime uh, example as to how and why. Oh, this is a big buy for me. And I like Fuqua, but this is better. Yeah. Bo both of these choices are, are much better than Fuqua. I think that Fuqua, when you, when you watch his movies, obviously there's... Uh, Magnificent Seven, I thought, was fun. Yeah, I enjoyed Magnificent Seven. I thought it was Seven. fun, and I th there, there wasn't much depth to it. You didn't really need much depth to it, and it was a fun popcorn movie, and that's really all it needed to be. With the Coen brothers and then Peter Berg possibly mm -hmm. doing this, Peter Berg has been crushing it lately. Um, I'm going to give him a super mulligan for Battleship be because since then, <laughs> he has been crushing I, it. I, forget, been on point, I yeah. forget he did that right. movie and every time. That's the point, is because the last three movies have made you forget mm. that. And that's how good he is. And he'd be great at something like this. It's not like based off a true story type thing, what he's been doing lately, but it's still in that gritty world that he'd be great. Now, take him off the table. And Hell or High Water was one of my favorite movies of last year. Also dealt in the in the kind of the gritty real world. That would be great to see with a Coen Brothers script. This is this right and for the fact what a great release date to put it in August. It's going to be when we do our list next year for most anticipated. It's going to be up there for me. Uh, it might be up there for me. I would totally buy either Peter Berg or Mackenzie directing the movie because, like Christian said, they both have worked in a world like Scarface before and brought that brilliantly to life. So whether their next project is a Scarface or something that has similar tones, totally buy that. The Coen brothers writing it scares me a little bit. And maybe it's just because I hated Hail Caesar so much. So Wasn't I. a fan of Burn yeah. After Reading. They've done some great stuff directing-wise recently. No Country for Old Men was fantastic, but I would have to ask you, why don't we have Cormac McCarthy write the first treatment and then let them adapt a screenplay from that? Because their original writing just has not got me. I know they're going to be adapting some of the original Scarface material, both from the 1932 version and the 82 version, but them writing does not get me excited. The director on the other hand, totally on board for either Berg or McKenzie. All right, what's next? Michael Douglas has confirmed via his Facebook page that he will indeed reprise his role as Hank Pym in Peyton Reed's Ant-Man and the Wasp. He confirmed his involvement with a picture taken in front of the original Ant-Man poster saying, need to start growing the goatee now. <laughs> Douglas also confirmed filming is scheduled to begin this July with a release date set for July 6, 2018. Christian Byersell, Michael Douglas returning for Ant-Man and the Wasp. I mean, I buy it. It's kind of like a no duh. I think that we, we knew it was going to happen. Um, and I think that it makes sense to uh, start to keep repeating myself for the narrative of what happened in the first movie. I, I want to see him in there. I think that it's good to, now that the Wasp is back in there, and, and, and after the first movie, how he was very hesitant to have his daughter go out and do it in the first place. It's now him more accepting, but he's still going to be more protecting of it. Some of the storyline wasn't really done with him yet. There were certain things that had happened in that movie. And, I'm assuming you all haven't seen it, but there are certain <laughs> things in that movie that I don't think were wrapped up yet for that character. So it makes sense that he'd be back. Bye. A huge buy for me I, because you know I wouldn't put it past Marvel to like move on from that part of the story, do something else in one. But I thought he was such a great addition to that movie, the way, what he brought to it, not just the character art himself, but the gravitas of the performer Mark, Michael Douglas coming in there. And I thought him and Paul played off each other great. I love hearing that he's going to be back, and you're right. There are more story things to do with him as well. I wouldn't mind seeing some of the old adventures of him as well yeah. going on there, too. So for me, it's a huge buy. Yeah, it's a, it's a buy for me, too. But there is always that fear that the next chapter is is kind of going to lose a couple of the side characters like they've done before, you know, or like with Jane Foster's no longer in Thor. and uh, the, None of us lost any sleep. Yeah, yeah but, though, the, so. the, but the point is, you know, like the, the, the studio or the directors of the movie or whatever will be like, all right, so that side character's taking a step back now. So you think, are they going to do that with Hank Pym because he was a supporting character usually it's a love interest that does take a back seat he is not a love interest so i'm glad they have him back there was that fear that they weren't going to bring him back now that they are really pumped that they're doing that glad michael douglas is taking it it's good to know that michael douglas is hank pym isn't vicky vale is what you're saying you're <laughs> gonna get more of you because i love michael douglas the man's a national treasure and he belongs in any ant-man movie what i really sell about this story is the fact that john campia walked right by michael douglas at the rogue one premiere and i had to tell you you walked right by him and his face went so pale 
You look like powder. You're like, what? I just walked by Michael Douglas? <laughs> Michael Douglas looked good at that premiere, too. He's in shape. He's ready to do this. Oh, yeah. He looked great. All right, guys. Well, listen, as we do every day, Monday through Friday, we're doing this show live, and we like to save a little bit of time at the end of each episode to take your live Twitter questions. Make sure you're following us on Twitter, at Collider Video, and just start firing in those questions right now, and Wendy will pick a couple out to read at the end of the show. Now, as you know, we have our new movie march madness tournament coming up Whee. this year's topic is of course villains the greatest villains of all time and instead of our traditional 32 we are going to have 64 entrants this year we have four brackets of 16. we have the empire bracket we have the rogues bracket we have the nightmare bracket and we have the hydra bracket now we asked you guys we told you guys last week that we have all the entrants in now except for the final four spots, and you guys would determine who gets those final four spots. Last week, we had a wild card matchup between Juno Skinner, one of the villains from True Lies, against Dark Helmet from Spaceballs, yeah. and you guys overwhelmingly voted Dark Helmet by 82%, so Dark Helmet now makes it into the tournament. He will have the number 16 seed in the rogues bracket. Now, today is our next wild card match, and this up for grabs right now is the number 16 seed in the Empire bracket. And the two combatants are Simon Gruber, of course, the villain from Die Hard 3, and Regina George Ooh. from you know Mean Girls. <laughs> and we've got a spatter of applause through the studio here. One of these two will make it into our tournament. One will not, and it is up to you. Go to our Twitter page right now. Once again, you can find us on Twitter, at Collider Video, and there's a poll at the very top asking you guys to vote. Who gets into that number 16 seed in the Empire bracket? Will it be Simon Gruber or Regina George? I'm just going to go around the table quick on asking for votes. Who are you going to vote for, Mark? Interesting matchup, John. Neither one of these competitors is a natural blonde, but I am going <laughs> Simon Gruber for the win. Jeremy. Yeah, I think Gruber would destroy you. Yeah, Gruber. I'm... Uh, Die Hard 3, little known fact, Die Hard 3 is actually my favorite of the Die Hard franchise, and he's a big reason because of it. Regina George is a great villain. I'm actually going to vote Regina George. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to, if they're going head-to-head -head against each other, I'm looking at more of, like, who is a better villain overall in their stories. Regina George kills the the, the lame little brother. She was yeah. a freak in the cafeteria. Yeah. This guy it set up traps all over New York City. He was greedy. He was a greedy putz. Ten times all villains are. They're greedy Fortnite. putzes. Yeah. Fort Knox. Ashley, what about you? Who are you voting for? Obviously, Regina George tomorrow. I'm wearing army pants and flip flops just to support her. <laughs> so, Wendy? On Wednesdays, we're going to wear pink as yes. well. Definitely Regina George. <laughs> okay, but really, it's up to you guys who gets in. Go to our Twitter page right now and make sure you cast your vote. I also want to make sure you guys know that TV Talk returns today. Make sure you check out that new episode. It goes up a little bit later. A brand new episode of Jeremy Johns' show, <gasps> Awesome Tacular, dropped mm. on Friday. It's fantastic. Make sure you check that out on the Verizon Go 90 network. And also, we have a little match uh, coming up. You want to tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, we're in the second match of Title Week. And tomorrow, you have Team Trek, Scott Mance and Jason Inman going up against Jeff Snyder and Little Evil himself, JTE, the Patriots, for the titles. Check this out. We're a team of lions amongst a team of jackals. Jackals knit pick little pieces here and there. The jungles rule the kingdom. We eat the prey. We are the lion's den. We are back. We are the finest trained by Starfleet Academy. All right, all right, so number one. Yes, set a course. It's for victory. All right, guys, well, it is time for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. We take a couple questions every day, Monday through Friday, and, of course, our weekend Mailbag show on Saturday and Sunday. I want to thank Perry Nemiroff for joining me on that this past weekend. You can go check those out right now. So, Ashley, what is in the Mailbag today? Daniel writes, hey, guys and gals, Collider, love movie talk and Mailbag. Despite so many lackluster reboots from the 80s, one of the few movies I believe could benefit from a remake slash reboot would have have to be the last starfighter the cg could be updated as well as the technology of the video game that the title derives from do you think it would work and who should direct it thank you for taking the time to read my question well if i may i love the last starfighter <laughs> and i would I, they've been talking about a remake for a very long time they just haven't got off the ground um i love the idea i think it'll happen eventually 
there's a certain humor mixed with this kind of sci-fi fantasy, and Matthew Vaughn would be the perfect guy to do it. Oh. He would be the perfect guy to get that type of humor out there. Um, it is a great, and the other one that should be made from the 80s is Time Bandits. Those are the two that should be remade. Huh. Uh, Last Starfighter is awesome. I was talking to a friend of mine, actually, about like two weeks ago, I was talking to a friend of mine in Last Starfighter, he was, oh, I've never seen that. I'm like, what? Yeah. Stop what we're doing next Friday. We're getting together, we're gonna watch Last Starfighter. So I, if you see, and you know what, I love true badass villains that don't turn into sniveling wimps when they are defeated at the end, because as most villains do, one of the best final lines in that, what do we do? We die. Oh, <laughs> oh, love that movie. Yes, make another Last Ooh. Starfight. And it would benefit from modern technology, modern storytelling. The video are, games, too. And yeah. we are living yeah. in a video game age, so it's perfect. This is a reboot that needs to be made. Yeah, there's nothing more 80s greatness than Last Starfighter. I mean, there are a few things for sure, but if you, you hear the premise of The Last Starfighter, this video game was a test for pilots in this intergalactic war. And then this alien comes to this kid. It's like, by the way, you set the high score. You're in, kid. You're in. Now he gets to fight in Star Wars. And, uh, yeah, Last Starfighter would really benefit, especially with how connected the world is. It's actually a little more believable that an alien would be watching video games and actually hack into them. And uh, it, they'd actually get a... Uh, a bigger demographic of people, a lot more people, not just one. We can have ourselves a Last Starfighter army, not just to keep it with one, but I agree. Last Starfighter's 80, 80s wonder. Yeah, so some no good drain on society teenager is good at a video game, oh, then yeah. he gets to represent Earth. I've never seen the movie. No, that, that's how it works. He's not a, yeah, I guess he's He's close. a good kid. He gave me hope, he's a good Mark kid. Ellis. Like he gave me 20. hope. I All think right. he's a little older. Yeah. He's a little older. His brother is the one who, tried, who tries to get him at Lewis, was yes. his brother's name. Yeah. All right, then let's do this. I'm going to throw the name Jordan Vogue Roberts in there because he was really good with the Kings of Summer, we're working with a young sense of humor, but he also has Kong Skull Island yeah. now, so he can do something big budget as well. Hopefully, it's great. And the biggest reason why you take a guy like Jordan Vogue Roberts is because he didn't direct Pixels. <laughs> <laughs> all right, what's next? Joshua writes, hey, Collider crew, is it just me, or do you guys also think announcing which characters are going to be in movies like Avengers Infinity War or movies after Justice League reduces your enjoyment of the movies? For example, with Spider-Man and Guardians already announced in Infinity War, I feel like part of my enjoyment of their solo movies this year has been spoiled. Why do studios do this? Isn't it considered a spoiler? Because now I know there's nothing happening to them, even if their movies try to show them in danger. Thanks for taking my question. Well, I mean, look, you got to keep this in mind, too. Like, when they, when we heard that, um, oh, why, why am I blanking on his name? Uh, the greatest James Bond of all time. Our current uh, James Craig, Bond. Daniel, Daniel Craig. Daniel Craig. We heard Daniel Craig signed up to be Bond for a four-picture deal. Well, now we know he doesn't die in the first one. Of course <laughs> James Bond doesn't die. Mm. Did anybody out there think Spider-Man was going to die in Spider-Man Homecoming? I mean, although, I mean, how ballsy would that be? But, I mean, <laughs> no, they're not. Nobody thought he was going to die. So, so no, in, sometimes in situations, maybe. But, like, understanding that Guardians of the Galaxy, we know the Guardians of the Galaxy aren't going to die. They're just getting started with that franchise. We know Iron Man's not going to die. We know Spider-Man's not going to die. So... No, I don't think it is a spoiler at all any more than knowing that Sean Connery was signed for five pictures to do James Bond or anything like that because clearly they're not going to die. I don't con personally, I don't consider it a spoiler whatsoever. Jeremy, what about you? Yeah, absolutely. Because I mean, the thing about Spider-Man Homecoming, I never thought that, uh, that uh, Tom Holland Spider-Man was going to die. Now, whether or not his friends and family will be in real peril, that's where they can go. It's like, oh, your friend here or your family member here, maybe Aunt May will die. I have no idea, but that's where the suspense is. But yeah, there's when they're just starting out a franchise, I, I never think that that character is going to die. Like Batman Begins. Well, I guess Christian Bale's not going to die. You know, like Batman's not going to die. He's Batman gonna Begins, dot, 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 yeah, and ends. <laughs> yeah, right. That should have been the title. That's what I'm saying. That it would have really thrown people off. But I always saw Infinity War as everyone I've seen in the Marvel Cinematic Universe as a main player is going to be in there. In fact, I'd kind of like to know who isn't, so I'm not disappointed. But I'm seeing it as the crockpot, the hodgepodge of everybody coming to battle Thanos. So I believe that's what we're going to get. So that never really shows. Me. Yeah, it's a fair question, though. I mean, it does put a little bit more pressure uh, pressure on the directors, the writers of Infinity War to make us so wrapped up in this world, in this film, that we don't think about the fact that we know most of these people are probably going to survive to the second one, or even when we see Spider-Man Homecoming, to make us think that Spider-Man is in real danger. There's a, One of my favorite movies of all time is Apollo 13. It's based on a true story. I knew what happened. But in that moment, when I'm watching that movie, I have no idea what's happening next. That's on the filmmakers, the writers, the whole team.
I think it's just a matter. It's case by case. It's something like Infinity War. No, you, you all the reports and everything coming out, and you kind of assume that a lot of these people are going to be in the movie anyway. But there are certain characters like cameos and things you don't want spoiled. That, that, sure, if they do yeah. that, then you don't obviously. Um, but no, I don't think it necessarily spoils that. I mean, I think there's sometimes that they put people in trailers and they do die off, and you don't see it coming at all. Um, what I what I thought was silly was when they did the whole Rhodes Rhodey thing in uh, the Civil War trailer. They shouldn't have put that in there. I don't think. I mean, especially the way that that whole. That's another conversation. I think it was cheap anyway, the way that they went up doing that towards the end. But there are certain times it can throw you off. But this particular example, no, I don't think it throws you off. All right, I said we'd save some time to get your Twitter questions. We're going to do that right now. So, Wendy, what have you picked out? The first one comes from Dan Carr, who writes, Do you ever wish you could have a Men in Black memory wipe of trailers before you watch the movie? <laughs> oh. A couple times. Uh, yeah. yeah. Maybe yeah, a couple yeah, times. Abs absolutely. Yeah. Sometimes. I would take the memory wipe every time. And that doesn't mean I don't love watching trailers, because I do. I love watching trailers. I get so excited because they're little two-minute pieces of art. But once you actually get to the movie, I would take a memory wipe every damn time. Time. I want to know as little as possible. And instead of a Men in Black scenario, I, I'd go with a Memento scenario. I would love to forget that I saw it and leave a note for myself. Says John, you're really looking forward to this well, movie. That was it. Go all right, and then just walk into the movie. That's what I say. If I can take the memory away but keep the excitement that, or that I had for watching the trailers, then yes. But I think that a lot of times when you watch some of these trailers and you see certain images, it does enhance the excitement going into the movie. But there's times that they show the trailer and it's like. Well, what was this a movie that happened recently? And I can't, it was really recent. And I remember, oh, was it, it was, this, I don't know what it was, some horror film, whatever stupid, The yeah. Rings. Yeah. So they showed something in that trailer, and I knew that it hadn't happened yet. And yeah. I was like, either it's not in the trailer the or when it happens, oh, wait, this kind of gives away everything that's going on. And it did. It was, they gave away a, a really an important moment. Well, important for that stupid thing. But, uh, but anyway, there are certain times just don't show and I want to forget about it. Yeah, Avengers did that in the Avengers trailer where it shows Hulk grab Iron Man and slide down the building the whole time. I'm like, that hasn't happened. So when Stark puts the bomb up and he's dropping, I was like, he's fine. That is the moment where I'm like, they, yeah. they, I thought they might... Uh, be ballsy enough to kill Tony Stark. Glad they didn't. But I thought, hey, it's the Avengers movie. We've built up to this, so maybe. I would mess with people if I had that technology, though. I'd be like, Harlock, you're looking forward to this movie after I memory wipe you. You're in the movie. Boom, 50 shades darker and you hate <laughs> me for the rest of your life. That's what I would do. I'd get, I'd get a little villainous with that uh, technology. <laughs> All right, what's next? Arturo de Jesus writes, could it be that the Flash rewrite is to change the timeline since maybe Batfleck will be no more? Love the show, guys. Um... Uh, 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 Look, first part of the question. Yeah. It, like, like we were pointing out late earlier, maybe getting rid of all these scripts and, and whatever, changing directors and all that kind of is a, is a part of them having a bigger, wide scope idea about a new direction for their universe. That's totally possible. Uh, and, and we'll find out soon. But I don't think, from what I know, I don't think any determination has been made on... on uh, Affleck yet, so I don't think it goes that far. I don't know. What do you guys think? Affleck. Affleck. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that there is a meeting constantly happening at Warner Brothers and DC, and there's this long table, and nobody really wants to bring up Flashpoint just yet. They, they, they don't want to say it, but there's going to be one guy that maybe he's already done it, maybe he hasn't done it yet. Somebody's going to stand up in that room and be like, what if we just screw with the timeline and that's how we reboot everything? And it's not the worst idea I've ever heard. It's so risky, but at this point, what do they have to lose? If they have to go with a different Batman than Affleck, I don't hate that idea because at least it shows that they're being bold and making a decision. I, uh, I believe I hypothesized that either on Movie Talk or on Awesome Tacular that with all these script rewrites and this, that was like the, the Flash script is being rewritten. What if they're just going to use the Flash to reboot everything so a new Batman and a new direction, a new Joker all make sense because this DC Cinematic Universe reboot uh, or rebirth. So who knows what they're going to do. I could see it happening. I'm not putting my money on it. If I were in Vegas, I wouldn't bet on it, but I I can see the validity in that question. I could sure. see Vegas being where they come up with the idea to do <laughs> Flashpoint. All the great <laughs> decisions come from Vegas. All, All the great Vegas. Vegas. Yes. Well, it's risky, though. I mean, but Days of Future Past obviously did it. Um, sort of. They, 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 wiped out, they wiped out Brett Ratner's version, and that works for me. Um, <laughs> and you know, they could do it for sure, but like Mark said, it's very risky, yeah. and it could be just like cheap 
Um, or they could just try to go and recast if he if he takes off and try to just say, listen, those were the darker days. Now we're going to move on, and, and now everything's good, and we'll forget about it. Trust me. In like 10 years from now, if all the movies are great and working in, in sync, no one is going to give a crap about these times. They'd be like, oh, remember it? Yeah, I remember it. But now it's working like Marvel used to work. It's all possible. There's a lot of movies going to be coming out over the next 10, 20 years. Uh, hey, before we get to our last Twitter question of the day, I just want to see if any of you guys want to take a guess of where things stand right now with our poll for uh, the M March Movie Madness tournament between uh, Simon Gruber and Regina George. Regina George is leading, I bet you, i say by 63%. I, I, f I feel like she's leading, I, I would say Gruber. I think she's leading by 59 yeah, I think Gruber's really hamstrung by the fact that his older brother did it better. So I think Regina George is leading by 71% wow. to 29%. Uh, currently, as it stands right now, Regina George is in the lead, 52 to 48. Ooh, okay. It is a tight yeah. race. Vote Gruber. Wow. Vote Gruber. Uh, like we will announce the winner <laughs> on Wednesday and then uh, and then bring up the next, uh, we will bring up at that point, the next wild card match as well. All right, last Twitter question of the day. Last one comes from the J Scotty S14 who writes, with the sheer volume of characters, what you're over under for a, uh, Infinity Wars runtime? Oh, <laughs> over two hours. Well, understanding <laughs> yeah, that they are, they're, they are shooting the next two Avenger movies back to back. Yeah. Um, so I don't think they need to go stir crazy. I'm going to say two hours and five minutes. I, I would say two hours 20 at least. I'm a little more optimistic. I'm going nine hours. Yeah. Nine <laughs> hours with built-in intermissions. If they, there was ever a movie to bring back the classic intermission of Days of Yore, do it with Infinity War. We do not want to leave the theater. Well, we're getting two parts. Yeah. So uh, I'd say 2.15 for the first one. How, how, how long, long was the Civil War? I cannot remember. Yeah, it was, uh, it was like 15. 17 yeah, minutes, yeah, yeah. I think. Long, yeah. 17 minutes. All right, guys, that'll do it for us for this installment of Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to thank the guys sitting at the table with me. First of all, over there, Mr. Mark Ellis, where can people find you? This weekend, you can find me at the St. Louis Funny Bone Thursday through Saturday. You can get tickets at markellislive.com. And Wednesday, the Schmoes No Live show is back 7 p.m. PST. Right beside me, Mr. Jeremy Johns, freshly back from Seattle. Where can people find oh, you? Oh, visiting home. It's always fun. You can also find Mark at the Firehouse. I, you, by myself, <laughs> you can find me at Jeremy Johns on Twitter, at YouTube, the rest of the internet. You can find me on my Verizon Go 90 show, Awesome Tacular, dropping every Friday new episodes. We have some fun. We have some madness. We have some knowledge. Be there. You will love it. Mr. Christian Harloff, where can people find you? Uh, Twitter and Instagram at Christian Harloff, Jedi Council every Thursday. And like we mentioned, big title match, team title match tomorrow between the Patriots and Trek. And then Friday is the big one. You got Dan Merle defending his title against the outlaw, John Roca. Happens on Friday. Please check it out. Over there, we got Ashley Mova. Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Ashley Mova. Happy Monday, guys. She's already got her sweater half on. She's I like ready to go. <laughs> She's ready to go. Right beside cool. her, Wendy Lee. You can find me online voting for Regina George and on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, <laughs> at Wendy Lee Zaney. And of course, you can follow me on Facebook and on Twitter, simply at John Campia. Guys, make sure you go check out that awesome tacular show on the Verizon Go 90 Network. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is John Campia, and until next time, bye-bye. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.